Welcome back to Harbor Unboxed. So, one of the most requested side missions you guys had for us in our day one third gen Ryzen review was to test memory performance. Obviously, we were pretty pressed for time in that review, so we only checked out how DDR4-3200CL14 compared to the DDR4-3600CL16 memory that AMD supplied, and they claimed that that was the optimal configuration. Turns out there was very little difference between the two, and this led me to conclude that either will deliver optimal performance, and in addition to that, it was unlikely that spending more to get higher clocked DDR4 memory would be a wise investment. In the past, I've looked at manually tuning memory timings for first and second gen Ryzen, and I've found some solid performance gains, so it was something that I eventually wanted to revisit with third gen Ryzen. Until now though, I have delayed further memory testing in order to prioritize what I felt was more interesting content. Anyway, I finally got around to doing it, and I've done my best to leave no stone unturned. So. Let's get into the results. For testing, I'm using the Ryzen 9 3900X as this allowed me to work with a wide range of memory configurations, but I'll talk more about compatibility with cheaper processors at the end of the video. So make sure you check that out if you've got something like a Ryzen 5 3600, for example. All testing takes place at 1080p, but I've included GPU scaling results by using not just the RTX 2080 Ti, but also the RX 5700 and RX 580. So this will provide us with both CPU bound and GPU bound results. I'm also testing using the maximum and medium quality presets in four games. And there's really no need to do all this testing again at 1440p and 4K because we have those RX 580 results. So please keep that in mind. And each game did require a minimum of 120 benchmark runs to gather our data. The video really is all about three memory kits, G-Skills new Trident Z Neo, DDR4-3600CL16 memory, G-Skills FlareX DDR4-3200CL14 memory, and a dirt cheap memory kit from Team Group, which I purchased some time ago for some APU testing. It's their Team Group T-Force Dark DDR4-3000CL16 memory, and all of these are 16 gigabyte kits. The Team Group kit can be had for as little as $70 US, the Flarex stuff is roughly twice the price at $135 US, and the Trident Z Neo costs $170 US. For testing, I've run the Team T-Force Dark Memory in its out-of-the-box configuration, which you can see highlighted on this memory bandwidth graph. So this is with XMP loaded and nothing else altered. Then I've gone back and manually tuned all the timings for an optimal Samsung SDI configuration at 3000 mega transfers per second, or DDR4-3000. The G-Skill Flarex memory has been tested in its out-of-the-box spec with XMP loaded, and you can see that here. I've also lowered the memory speed to DDR4-3000, and this means we have a CL14 and CL16 comparison between the Flarex and T-Force memory. Then finally, we have the Triton Z Neo and it's out of the box spec at DDR4-3600, as well as DDR4-3800, and that is an overclock configuration using the XMP timings. And then finally, a third max OC configuration at DDR4-3800 with manual timings. Here's a quick look at the manual timings used for the DDR4-3000 and 3800 configurations. If you'd like to tune up your own memory, then I suggest downloading the Ryzen DRAM calculator. It's a seriously cool tool and it's quite easy to use. But if you guys do need any help using it, and there are quite a few of you requesting this, I could make a separate video on how to take advantage of tightening up those memory timings. So let's look at the memory latency for the various test configurations. We see a rather large 6% reduction in latency going from CL14 DDR4-3000 to 3200, with just a 3% reduction when jumping from 3600 CL16, and then another 3% reduction to 3800 CL16. The focus of this video will be on gaming performance, but for those of you wondering, these memory speeds and timings don't generally impact application performance all that heavily, though this is a rather large generalization, but I did say generally. Obviously, any memory sensitive applications will be impacted, but for rendering and encoding type benchmarks, you won't see much of a difference. And you can see that here when looking at the Corona results. We see just a 6% improvement in performance when going from DDR4-3000 to DDR4-3800, which isn't much given we see a massive 32% increase in memory bandwidth. Okay, so time for some games, and I'm going to start with Assassin's Creed Odyssey using the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti 
at 1080p with the ultra high quality preset enabled. Here we see some interesting results. Firstly, there is very little difference between DDR4 3200, 3600 and 3800 using the XMP timings. Low latency DDR4 3000 does drop away a little, most notably for the 1% low frame rates, and we see performance slide a little more when using CL16 timings. However, quite interestingly, by tuning up the DDR4 3000 memory, we can actually produce better results than what we got with the CL16 3800 configuration, which really is quite incredible. By manually tuning the timings, we see an incredible 38% boost to the 1% low performance and a 15% increase for the average frame rate. I'm pretty blown away by that. But for even better results, if we tune up the DDR4 3800 memory, we get a further 8% boost for the average frame rate and 10% for the 1% low. This means whereas the 3900X was enabling around 80 FPS on average with the out of the box settings, with a little tinkering to the memory, we've got that up to 90 FPS. Interestingly, reducing the quality settings does reduce the margin seen when using the ultra high preset. And I believe this is because there's less CPU load when using the medium quality settings. So we become more GPU limited for this test. Doesn't sound quite right given we've lowered the visual quality settings, but I do believe that's the case. Whatever the situation though, the tuned DDR4 3800 configuration is now just 6% faster than the XMP version. Still tuning up the budget DDR4-3000 memory does enable premium DDR4-3800-like performance. In an effort to provide a more complete picture, I've also tested with the mid-range Radeon RX 5700, and here we do see a very different picture. Using the ultra quality preset, we're now entirely GPU limited at 1080p, and as a result, memory performance has almost no impact on performance. You'd have to drop down to an unrealistic spec such as DDR4-2133 to see a drop off in performance. Since 3rd gen Ryzen officially supports DDR4-3200, I really didn't see the need to test lower than 3000 since you really shouldn't be using slower memory and that makes it somewhat of a pointless test. This time though, the medium quality settings do provide some variance in the results, Though that's only because we're no longer heavily GPU bound at these higher frame rates. Again, manually tuning the DDR4-3000 memory allows it to match the DDR4-3800 XMP configuration, as well as the GPU limited manual 3800 spec. Then with a Radeon RX 580 installed, or a GPU of roughly the same performance, we're again heavily GPU bound. There is slightly more variance here than what we saw with the RX 5700, but Ultimately, we're looking at results that are largely within the margin of error. Even when reducing the quality preset a few notches to medium, we're looking at just a 6% difference between the absolute fastest and slowest configurations. So when memory shopping, it's important to take into consideration the graphics card you'll be using, and then I suppose also the resolution and quality settings. Here's how all the Assassin's Creed Odyssey 1080p ultra quality data looks when compared on one graph. And there are a few important takeaways that we need to discuss here. Firstly, yes, faster memory can boost performance, but for the serious gains, you'll need to manually tune your memory, and this will enable massive performance gains in CPU limited scenarios. However, it's also very important to note that when GPU limited, the gains will be little to none. And while that might seem obvious, almost all third gen Ryzen memory testing that I've seen online to date has been conducted primarily under CPU limited conditions. As you can see here, even with a mid-range GPU at 1080p like the Radeon RX 5700, faster memory has little to offer. In this particular instance, it actually has nothing to offer, and obviously the same is true when using a slower GPU, such as the RX 580. In fact, you'll likely end up being GPU bound, even with an RTX 2080 Ti, at least when using a modern processor with six or more cores. If we increase the resolution to just 1440p, this reduces the 2080 Ti to about 70 FPS on average, with a 1% low figure of about 50 FPS. So that's very similar to what we see from the RX 5700 at 1080p, and that means GPU bound performance, and that means the faster memory will have very little chance to make a difference. Using the medium quality settings, we find even for 70 FPS on average, you're gonna be much more GPU bound than you are CPU bound. And it's not until we start to push over 80 FPS that the game becomes a little more CPU limited using these settings at 1080p. And for those wondering, the RTX 2080 Ti only averages 106 FPS 
at 1440p with a 1% 1 low of 67 FPS. So similar to what we see with the RX 5700 at 1080p. This means when going above the official AMD spec of DDR4-3200, you can really only expect performance to boost by up to 10% with the faster memory. Next up, I tested all memory configurations in Far Cry New Dawn, and this time we see a mere 4% boost over DDR4-3200 when manually tuning the DDR4-3800 memory. Interestingly though, there is quite a drop off with the DDR4-3000 memory, and even manually tuning the timings doesn't help make up the ground on the higher frequency kits. We know Far Cry New Dawn is quite memory sensitive, so this is likely the issue with the DDR4-3000 memory. We see a similar thing when using the Radeon RX 5700, though interestingly here, the manually tuned DDR4-3800 memory does offer a nice performance boost here, making it 7% faster than the DDR4-3200 memory. Then with the RX 580, we're entirely GPU limited at around 80 FPS, so you'll need to be pushing over 100 FPS and Far Cry New Dawn with the ultra quality preset to take advantage of faster memory. Reducing the quality preset two levels down to normal really doesn't change that much. The RX 580 average frame rate is only boosted by 10 FPS, so as a result, we are still heavily GPU limited. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege, and here we have a mostly GPU bound competitive shooter. Using the RX 5700 or an equivalent mid-range GPU, we'll see no change in performance when using the ultra quality settings, even at 1080p. So needless to say, we'll see the same with slower GPUs, such as the RX 580. Even with the RTX 2080 Ti, we're only seeing a 4% boost in performance going from DDR4 3200 up to manually tuned 3800 memory. And reducing the quality settings for higher frame rates still sees the RX 5700 provide a heavily GPU bound scenario. With the RTX 2080 Ti, we're still only seeing a 4% boost from DDR4 3200 to the manually tuned 3800 memory. Last up, I tested World War Z, and at 1080p using the ultra quality settings, the RX 580 averaged just over 140 FPS, and despite that, we're still heavily GPU bound. Even with the cheap DDR4-3000 kit, we see a little bit of variance with the RX 5700, but even so, the manually tuned DDR4-3800 memory was just 7% faster than the budget 3000 stuff. So that's pretty weak, though we do see a 15% boost to the 1% lows. Still, when compared to the 3200 memory, the fastest configuration only offered a 9% boost in performance. When using the medium quality preset, we do see a seriously large boost to the 1% low performance when using manually tuned memory, namely the DDR4-3800 stuff. With the RTX 2080 Ti, we see an 18% boost for the manually tuned DDR4-3800 over the low latency CL14 DDR4-3200 memory. Certainly a nice boost there, though once again you can expect those gains to largely disappear at 1440p, even with an RTX 2080 Ti. Well, that's what I spent almost a week of my life doing, so I hope you guys found the results interesting. There is a bit more I want to discuss before wrapping this up though, and one thing I would like to talk about is the FCLK, which is the clock frequency for the Infinity Fabric. By default, it operates at the memory frequency, which is half the data rate. So DDR4-3000, for example, runs at 1500 megahertz. I know it's often referred to as 3000 megahertz memory, but that's actually wrong. It's 3000 mega transfers, which is the data rate. Anyway, with first and second gen Ryzen, you couldn't adjust the Infinity Fabric frequency. It always just ran at the memory clock speed. So 1500 megahertz for DDR4-3000, 1600 megahertz for 3200, 1700 megahertz for 3400, and 1800 megahertz for 3600. And that was generally about as high as those parts would go. Third gen Ryzen is very similar, though this time AMD has opened up the ability to manually adjust the Infinity Fabric frequency. However, I have found decoupling the Infinity Fabric from a one-to-one -one ratio with the memory is generally not a good idea and it won't boost performance, at least for the most part. Here is an example using DDR4-3000 memory. Using the one-to-one -one ratio, 1500 megahertz, we get a memory latency of just 72.6 nanoseconds. And of course, lower is better when measuring latency. 
overclocking the Infinity Fabric by 100 megahertz without increasing the memory frequency increases the latency by roughly six nanoseconds, which isn't good. And even with a 20% overclock on the Infinity Fabric at 1800 megahertz, we're still at 76.2 nanoseconds, which is a 5% increase in latency. And that's not really what you wanna see. Here's what the memory latency looks like with DDR4 2133 memory. And as you can see, stock using CL14 timings, we're at just over 100 nanoseconds of delay. Overclocking the Infinity Fabric to 1900 megahertz, it does help a bit at this low memory speed, but at around 90 nanoseconds, it's still way slower than DDR4 3000 memory with the Infinity Fabric at a one-to-one -one ratio at 1500 megahertz. And just look at that hit to the memory bandwidth. Here we see 2133 memory is only good for around 32 gigabytes per second, while 3000 is good for 44 gigabytes per second, and 3600 pushes the read throughput up to 55 gigabytes per second. Then in games we find this, and yes, the overclocked Infinity Fabric helps a little when at ridiculously low memory speeds, but it's not the key to making low clocked memory fast. That is to say the gains aren't primarily coming from the overclocked Infinity Fabric, but rather the manually tuned memory timings. To prove this, I went back and tested with manually tuned DDR4-2133 CL12 memory with a 1900 megahertz Infinity Fabric clock. But in the games I tested, I couldn't even match the base DDR4-3000 configuration, which is honestly what I expected to find. But this does bring me to my next batch of notes. I suspect for most third gen Ryzen processors, a 1900 megahertz Infinity Fabric clock speed is going to be a bit too much. For example, my 3900X did it quite comfortably, but it was a bit sketchy with my 3700X and my retail 3600X and 3600 CPUs wouldn't go above 1800 megahertz. And the vanilla 3600 even required a bit of tinkering to get it stable at 1800 megahertz. That being the case, I feel like DDR4-3600 is the sweet spot, as AMD suggested, uh, particularly for the X models. All the higher end third gen Ryzen processors should handle that frequency without any issues. But for the cheaper models, I think DDR4-3200 to 3400 will be a safer bet. And as we found, even 3000 is perfectly fine, especially if you're comfortable tuning the sub timings. All that said, it is well worth keeping in mind that you're very likely going to be GPU bound in most instances anyway, as these third gen Ryzen processors are very fast, even with loose DDR4 memory. But it's good to know you can buy a relatively cheap 16 gigabyte Samsung S die kit for $70 and still get close enough to maximum performance out of even something like a Ryzen 9 3900X with a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. And that is at what I would say most gamers would agree are unrealistically low resolutions and quality settings, at least for that particular combo. So Ryzen certainly doesn't require expensive premium memory to perform at its best. And in fact, for those of you buying a Ryzen 5 processor, I'd strongly recommend you avoid spending big on memory, avoid the premium stuff, just get the cheap memory. And then if you are at risk or you feel like you're being a bit too CPU bound, then you can tune that memory up and that should get you out of trouble. And that is gonna do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, please give it a like. It took a huge amount of time and energy. And yeah, if you do appreciate all the time and energy we put into content like this, then jump over to our Patreon page. You can support work like this more directly and you also gain access to some cool perks such as our Patreon live stream that Tim and I do each month and our Discord chat where you can talk to us more directly whenever you have a question or a suggestion, stuff like that. And yeah, we can interact with you more directly that way. But as always, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.